For Krima Media's policy, this is Sane Zamini. Joining me today is First Director of Public Prosecutions in South Africa, Bulela Nengoga, to discuss his book titled, The Sting in the Tay. So as a National Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Nguga, you made a decision that unleashed a political tsunami on the 23rd of August, 2003. Uh, despite a recommendation to prosecute the then uh, Deputy President Jacob Zuma, you decided not to. Given what we know now, do you regret your decision? No, not at all. Um, because my decision at the time was based on the evidence that was available. Mm -hmm. And so because uh, at the time I felt that there was insufficient evidence, I, I therefore was duty bound not to proceed with a trial, which I did not believe will result in a conviction. And then a few days after that, uh, Shapir Sheikh, who was his advisor, was charged. Why did you find it easier to charge uh, Mr. Sheikh? Because we had direct evidence that indicated Sheikh in all the charges, hence he was convicted. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, uh, Mr. Zuma, the evidence that we have was uh, uh, circumstantial. It was based largely on correspondence that was written by other people and not by him. And they were writing about him and claiming that he said things to them Whereas, and those people were not available to come and give evidence against him. And so it was then very dicey for me to proceed with a trial on the basis of that evidence, which I considered at the time to be insufficient. And what is interesting is that you knew that when you charge someone at that level, you were expected to have what, what was mentioned in the book as a watertight case, which uh, was clearly not for, for Zuma. Tell us about that. We all believe, and we say so all the time, that we're all equal before the law, which is true. However, in, when you have to charge a person in the position of a deputy president of a country, you have to take those factors into consideration because you don't want to plunge the country into chaos. You have to take those considerations and make sure that uh, you don't bring a case that you are going to lose. And the consequences thereof, as they say, too ghastly to contemplate. So you just don't take chances. And uh, talking about uh, chances and then other people not being happy about your decision, including people that were in the prosecuting team. Tell us about that. Yes. I mean, the, the guys who were leading the team, Billy Downer and Gerda Ferreira, mm. um, they believed that they had a good case against him. And uh, they then recommended that I should, I should, I should prosecute him. Mm. And I must agree. To, to what they were saying. I reviewed their decision and I consulted um, a senior counsel at the time uh, who agreed with my views in the matter. And so I communicated my decision to them. Of course, they were unhappy with the decision that I took. And I told them that uh, when I make the announcement that I'm not going to charge them, I'm going to state that their view was that I should prosecute so that they must feel themselves that uh, it's not something that I'm doing under the table. I'm hiding it. Um, I'm going to tell the world that their view is that we should charge him, but however, I disagree with them. And they accepted that. And they, they were happy, which is why then I went on to state when I was giving the reasons that uh, although there's a prima facie case against him, it was indeed that there was, but that the case, I felt that it was not winnable. And on that basis, I was not going to proceed with the trial, which I did. I think that was the right decision at the time. I still think so now. And on a woman's month, uh, I think it is fitting for me, uh, Mr. Nguga, to ask you to tell us how you kept supporting your mother after your father had passed on. My mother had always been there for me. Um, at every turn, at every turn when I had to take major decisions or something significant happened to me, 
she was there to support me. You know, when I decided that I was going to be a lawyer, my father was, uh, was very skeptical, was worried about it. He went on to say that all good lawyers end up in jail. And he mentioned people like uh, Nelson Mandela, Louis Chizan, and said, uh, oh, Chris, they all ended up in jail, all the good lawyers. And he was worried that uh, the same thing will happen to me. But my mother, my mother prevailed upon him and said, uh, no, allow the child to do what he wants to do. And, and so when I started practicing, I went to Devon, which was uh, an unfamiliar territory for me. Familiar terrain. She, she gave me a car. My first car, I got it from her. And so when I qualified, it then became just my duty to support my mother, which I did until the day she died. When I was in detention for the first time in 1981, I was detained uh, under the Section 6 of the Terrorism Act and kept, and kept in detention for eight months. My mother is the one who, who issued a press statement calling upon the authorities then to charge or release, uh, charge or release my son. When I was, uh, I was getting married, uh, I decided to get married when I was in jail and I had no resources whatsoever. It was my mother yes. and my wife's family who organized the, the wedding for us. I didn't contribute. I didn't even have a sign to contribute for my own wedding. And so when I was again accused of being a spy, it was my mother who mobilized a number of women in the Eastern Cape to come and support me. And again, issued a statement saying my son was never a spy. So you see, um, I owe so much, so much to her. Um, I'm here today because of her. You were also arrested in 1977 when the students were protesting uh, when Bigo was killed while in police detention. Tell us how you were politicized. Well, I, I come from a place, uh, uh, Middle Drift, which is just outside Alice and King Lamstown, mm. which is on the foothills of the uh, Amatola Mountain. And that is the area where we held the British for over 100 years. And that is where uh, we, we went through probably seven wars of resistance against the English. Mm. And so that area has been the hotbed of resistance throughout. And I was born in that area. And so it's the struggle came naturally to me. Now, in 1977, Steve Biko died in detention. He was killed, actually, was in detention. And we, as the students, decided to organize a memorial service for him. The authorities banned it. We decided to proceed with it, nevertheless. And we held it at the David Stadium at Fort Hill. At that time, there was a prohibition on open air gatherings. Um, and so when we did, the police arrived and arrested us. They only arrested the male students. The females and the lecturers were allowed, were released. We were taken to Fort Lamogan prison in East London. That's where we spent probably about two weeks uh, in detention. I'm glad I went through that because by the time I was detained in 1981, at least I knew what to expect from prison. We were lucky because the old Mr. Tanga was practicing there uh, in Aitujua in Transkai. He visited his son, Malelo, and offered to bail him out. But Pumi refused and said, you can only bail me if you bail all the students. And there he, he did, which he did. And he paid for all of us. And we were then released from prison. Mm -hmm. I later uh, was charged with the contravention of the Writers' Assemblies Act and we were sentenced to 30 to 30 days. And we appealed that sentence and on appeal it was converted to a question and discharge. And in the yeah. book, you also tell us about, I feel it was maybe one of your proudest moments, uh, Mr. Muga, when you met uh, Nelson Mandela uh, while he was still in prison in 1989. You were part of a delegation uh, in, that was including anti-apartheid lawyers like uh, Ubabu Payas Langa and Azaka Charles. What was discussed that day? Matiba briefed us about uh, the discussions that he was having with the government. Mm -hmm. 
and he briefed us. He, he took us through the letter that he had written um, to declare and the conditions that he had raised with declared, which would lead to negotiations taking place. And he was telling us that it is important that they be a negotiated settlement to the problems of South Africa. That's what he took us through. It was indeed a very special occasion for us to meet Matiba. I had never met him. And uh, he, he knew one of my colleagues, Untobe Gomakubela, who was, we had been incarcerated with him. He also knew the fact that the year before, in 1988, I was the chairman of the Mandela uh, Birthday Committee. We celebrated his 70th birthday, and I was the chairman of that committee in the Western Cape, and I ended up being detained just for organizing his birthday. And so he, he thanked me for that and laughed at the fact that I was arrested just for organizing a party. And in the book, you also speak about your detention after the funeral now of uh, Griffith Mkenge. That time was lonely, but you befriended some guards. And while I was reading the book, it became so interesting because you managed to get away with a few things while you were detained. <laughs> Would you mind sharing that with us? Yes. You know, I, I was arrested on a Monday, 30th of November, 1981. And uh, I was interrogated by the police uh, that day. And um, of course, I denied everything. Um, and then, as they were interrogating me, it was easy at the beginning to say no, yes, I don't know, no, yes, I don't know. And then, when it came to the crunch, and all the time I had my hands in my pockets, and when it came to the serious questions, uh, I took my hands out of my pockets. And the police noticed. They say, yeah, ne. Um, so, and I realized afterwards that was a plan on my part because I gave a signal that I knew what they were talking about, but I was just denying it. I got to my cell. I was so tired. I had worked the whole week making arrangements for GM's funeral. So I got to my cell. I slept the whole night and the whole day. Um, on night, Wednesday, a, one of the policemen came in, a uniformed police guy, whom I recognized because as I was practicing in Devon, so I was meeting these guys. So he came and, uh, and I saw him and he immediately warned me that there were microphones that were set in my room and that we mustn't, we mustn't talk. Whatever I say to him, it must be in writing. And he gave me a pen. And I wrote a very simple note. Uh, I said, he must take to my wife. Gave, gave him my wife's address. Said, simple note, said, look, I'm here, I'm fine, no problem. And the following day, he came back with a response from her. And then that started a channel of communication. And by then, I was just working with this guy, you know, and he was very great to us. And then we used him to communicate with the, uh, my fellow prisoners. And, and then I got to know what it is that the police knew and what they wanted from us, which then helped me by the time they interrogated me, I was on top of my game, no longer with hands in my pocket. And some of your fellow prisoners was uh, Praveen Gordon, who was not too far from your cell. He was adjacent to my cell, yes. We spent a lot of time uh, uh, together. We would talk to the police officers who were uh, uh, looking after us, U uniform one. They will open our doors and then we can talk to each other. Um, though we were neighbors. So we spent a lot of time together with Pravin. But he was later released before me. And while you were also there, you found out about uh, Dr. Neil Agat's death while you were also there. Tell us about that time. I didn't know personally Neil Agat, um, but we heard uh, from the grapevine that Neil Agat had died. It died in detention. And so we decided on our own that we'll go on a hunger strike and demand that we be released as well, uh, which we did. Uh, we spent a number of days uh, not eating. And we are also demanding to be visited by our families, which they allowed. Uh, out of the blue, my mother and my wife came to see me. 
which was great. And then, of course, we called off the hunger strike because we could never hunger strike indefinitely. Um, and that was my first experience of a hunger strike. And lastly, Mr. Nguga, as a person who has also played a pivotal role in our country's first democratic parliament, how do you feel about the African National Congress members uh, who are now fingered in corrupt dealings that have crippled uh, the country's economy? I feel very bad about what's happening in my organization. Um, I feel very bad about what's happening in my country. But you know what? This is my country. This is our country. We have nowhere else to go. We've got to fix it. We have a responsibility to ensure that we fix our organization and we fix our country. And it requires all of us, all of us, just as we did during the upper date days, to mobilize all of us to do the right thing. We cannot sit back and fold our arms and say, this is the problem for Cyril Ramaphosa, that he must fix all the problems of this country. He can't do it. We can. If we all work together, we can. It's only the ANC that can solve the problems of, this, of South Africa. There's no other organization that is capable of doing so. You might not believe it, but that is the reality. You might not like what I'm saying, but that's what it is. And therefore, all of us must put our shoulder on the wheel and make sure that we take our country forward. We have a great country, huge possibilities. We have lots of responsibilities, lots of challenges, but we can solve them. Working together, we can solve them. That was Mr. Bulela Ninduga in conversation with Polity about his book titled The Sting in the Tay.